copious notes at almost every conversation when he put quotes in his opening statement. He said those were direct quotes from what was said. It also doesn't hurt that he has a voice like Edward R. Murrow. So he, he's a pretty impressive presence up there. And I think very non-political. He went out of his way to talk about what he knew, what he was specifically a uh, testament to. He, the only thing he talked about was a strong feeling that it was in the U.S. national security interests to uh, support Ukraine in the fight against Russia, but he certainly wasn't taking any partisan position. Good morning and welcome to Morning Joe. It is Thursday, November 14th. Along with Joe, Willie and me, we have White House reporter for the Associated Press, Jonathan Lemire, the host of MSNBC's Politics Nation and president of the National Action Network, Reverend Al Sharpton. NBC News correspondent Heidi Prisbilla, former Justice Department spokesman, now an MSNBC justice and security analyst, Matt Miller, and historian and author of Soul of America and Rogers Professor of the Presidency <coughs> at Vanderbilt University, John Meacham is with us. He's an NBC News and an MSNBC contributor. Joe, it all started uh, in open testimony yesterday. What a day. Well, anybody that was expecting a repeat of the testimony of Robert Mueller uh, would have been surprised uh, mm -hmm. by what happened yesterday. We had some new revelations, some pretty shocking revelations, and also, though, mainly a lot of, uh, of, of steady testimony uh, that continues to blow holes in the Republicans and, and the White House's uh, defense. So we'll get to that in a little bit. It is, it is something, though, how Republicans are chasing their tails. And coming up with laughable defenses that will once again be proven false in the coming days. Yeah, the revelation from yesterday's impeachment hearing that directly implicates President Trump in the Ukraine scandal. It came from Ambassador Bill Taylor, who testified alongside State Department official George Kent in the probe's first public hearing yesterday. During his opening statement, Ambassador Taylor testified about a July 26th phone conversation that happened just one day after Trump's controversial call with the president of Ukraine. Watch. In the presence of my staff at a restaurant, Ambassador Sondland called President Trump and told him of his meetings in Kyiv. The member of my staff could hear President Trump on the phone asking Ambassador Sondland about the investigations. Ambassador Sondland told President Trump the Ukrainians were ready to move forward. Following the call with President Trump, the member of my staff asked Ambassador Sondland what President Trump thought about Ukraine. Ambassador Sondland responded that President Trump cares more about the investigations of Biden, which Giuliani was pressing for. Two sources tell NBC News that the aide who overheard the phone call inside that Ukrainian restaurant is David Holmes, the counselor for political affairs at the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine. He is expected to testify behind closed doors tomorrow should be interesting well i mean what's going to be really interesting what, what phone were, they, were they on a burner phone i mean what what phone were they on now what's so funny is that that the republicans are now going back to what they tried at the beginning of this process with the whistleblower and mm -hmm. at the beginning of the process they said oh it's hearsay it's hearsay you can't trust the hearsay it's hearsay of course Lindsay, poor Lindsay, uh, obviously, wherever he went to law school, they didn't have an evidence class. But they said, here, here, say, here, say. And then the Democrats rolled out a plethora of witnesses who proved it wasn't hearsay and that it was firsthand evidence. So what did Republicans then say? Oh, we can't move forward until we hear the hearsay. We can't move forward until we get the whistleblower here. Who, of course, they were saying had evidence, had, had a hearsay. And so, Willie, the same thing's going to happen here now. Oh, the phone call, it's secondhand, thirdhand, fourthhand. This is terrible. This is stupid. And you can see it, as my old torts professor, uh, Professor Pearson, would say, like a freight train slowly coming at you out of the mist. You know what's going to happen? They're going to hear testimony from the person that was at the table, and it will no longer be hearsay. So the dog continues to chase its tail and all we can do is sit back look down amused shaking our heads because the republicans have no defense and let's remember we don't even have to wait for that 
The hearsay argument blew up when Lieutenant Colonel Vinman testified, when he gave a deposition, because he was on the phone call. Right. That was firsthand. And let's add in something else on the hearsay question. A lot of the firsthand witnesses have been blocked from testifying in these proceedings. Blocked right. by who? By the White House and by the State Department. So the hearsay argument does not hold up. Um, Matt Miller, some of the other arguments made yesterday that the aid was released. Well, it was released because the whistleblower report came out and the hand was forced by the White House, the White House was forced. Also, that they didn't, that Ukraine didn't know the aid had been held up. That's blown up, we know, by reporting from the New York Times that Ukraine knew in early August about that. Argument after argument, I guess, when you don't have the, the facts on your side, when you know you're in a corner, you present these arguments to the public who may not have heard them already that we all know from reporting and from firsthand testimony have all been blown up and undermined already. Yeah, I was surprised at how ineffective the Republican response was yesterday. We know that the, the facts they're working with aren't very good. They don't have yeah. a lot of factual defenses. But if you've watched kind of Republican conspiracy theories in the past, Benghazi or Fast and Furious, you know, they usually will take one conspiracy theory and stick with it. Yeah. And yesterday they were kind of picking together all these disparate points and not really weaving them together in any kind of coherent narrative. And I thought that was a problem for them. Uh, I think this this new information that Colonel uh, that uh, Ambassador Taylor testified to and that uh, a member of his staff is going to come testify to in private tomorrow was really devastating. Number one, it knocks out this new argument they were trying to to advance that the president just cared about corruption in Ukraine, which was always mm -hmm. absurd. If you read that call transcript, he doesn't care about corruption in, in Ukraine. He didn't bring up any reforms to the prosecutor's office. He only cares about Joe Biden. But I think it was also really important because it really jams Gordon Sondland, who in some ways is going to be a key witness, because Gordon Sondland, his previous testimony said, he didn't know, he had no idea that Burisma meant Joe Biden. He never heard anyone talk about Joe Biden until after the call transcript was released in September. And now you've got Gordon Sondland, you know, a witness who's going to come in and say that is flat out untrue. And I think it puts Gordon yeah. Sondland in a really difficult position. And if I were him, I'd be worried about getting, coming clean and telling the truth about what I know about my conversations with the president when I come up next week. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he, he's got to worry about perjury. He's also got to worry about lying and lying under oath. The guy does not want to end up in jail uh, because he lied for Donald Trump. He can, he can just call uh, Michael Cohen and find out that, that that doesn't work very well. John Meacham, let, let's, let's key in also on a couple of arguments that the Republicans made yesterday that are just preposterous, and that is, well, the aid, they ended up getting the aid anyway. So... Mm. This, this extortion didn't work. Uh, of course, we can look at, at, you know, FBI often kicks down doors and arrests conspirators while they're making the bomb or planning the bank robbery. It's still a crime. And of course, historically, Watergate, not a successful burglary, a third rate botched burglary that brought down an entire government. Just because Donald Trump failed at extorting uh, the Ukrainians doesn't mean it's not impeachable. And in Watergate, the, if the burglary was third rate, as Ron Ziegler said, the cover up was fourth or fifth rate because it pretty self-evidently didn't work because here we are talking about it. Uh, and, and President Nixon went back to, to San Clemente. So, whoops. Uh, but still impeachable. You had Republican support for the first article, which was about uh, the cover up, the attempted destruction of justice, which is the, the more serious term. I don't think I, I, I watched a, a great deal of yesterday, and I, and I kept, you know, trying because we're ordered by the Enlightenment uh, example to keep an open mind to weigh contrary evidence, but there just wasn't any contrary evidence uh, to the idea that the president has uh, abused his power in a remarkable way. I thought one of the uh, great moments, uh, which was, and I loved. Uh, Mika, we haven't mentioned this, that uh, your father was mentioned as a paragon, uh, yeah. as was uh, Henry, Henry Kissinger uh, for George Kent. But, you know, looking at uh, Secretary Kent, Undersecretary Kent and Ambassador Taylor, you know, you sort of saw the ghosts of Dean Acheson and Robert Lovett uh, up against, you know, the, these guys on the Republican side, these contestants from The Apprentice. Uh, you had right. this cultural clash between 
the wise men of the old era and and 